support development. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you all today. Um, I'm going to be telling you about some work that I did, as you mentioned recently, um, partly overlapping with my postdoc. And the, uh, the, we named our algorithm Liger, um, and this is a picture of a Liger, what you get if you cross a lion and a tiger. Um, and I'm excited for this talk because I'm going to get to focus on some of the algorithmic details, which um, I don't usually get to talk about because there are a lot of biologists in the audience. And uh, usually these things get relegated to the, the end of the supplement. So I'm excited to get to share a little bit about the, <clears throat> the actual inner workings of the approach. And the, the heart of the approach is non-negative matrix factorization. Um, and so I'm going to share some of the things that I've learned about the spectrum of options that are available when you're implementing a non-negative matrix factorization approach. So the overall problem that we're interested in solving um, with this algorithm is moving from qualitative definition of cellular identity which is the traditional way biologists think about cell identity, to a quantitative definition. So qualitative definition um, of cell types has traditionally been based on things like morphology. So how does the cell look under the microscope? We can see that there are clearly different cell shapes, and these are likely different cell types. Surface markers, um, painstakingly characterizing a handful of surface markers, which the presence or absence uh, de decides whether a cell is of type A or B. Um, or phenotypic properties, where um, you can do some kind of measurement on the cell, like if you're thinking about neurons, a phenotypic property of interest could be the firing pattern. And so based on some ad hoc combination of these qualitative properties, biologists have traditionally defined cell types. But now with the with the invention of various single cell genomic technologies, we have the opportunity to revisit the definition of cell type and um, properties of cell identity um, from a quantitative perspective using all of these different types of omics which have been initially developed in bulk and now um, we can perform them on a single cell level. So we can measure um, expression. Single cell RNA-seq is by far the most widely used um, method for measuring single cell properties. Um, you can also do uh, single cell methylation sequencing and attack seq which gives you chromatin accessibility measurements. You can also do high seq and most recently people have started doing spatial transcriptomics where you have a 2D or 3D coordinate for the cell along with um, its gene expression profile. And so the kind of grand goal um, that I set out to um, achieve was to try to leverage all these different types of measurements across a range of biological settings to move toward a quantitative definition of cellular identity. And in order to accomplish this, we want several properties. We want to be able to identify both similarities and differences in corresponding cells across conditions, species, and tissues. And part of the reason for this is because um, we want to be able to understand the distinction between sort of the invariant properties of a cell type that makes it that cell type across settings but we also want to understand the main modes of variation in which a particular cell type can vary. Um, for example, um, uh, in response to treatments or environmental conditions. Or <coughs> we also want to be able to capture continuous and discrete modes of cellular variation. So the uh, um, traditional way in which people have thought about cell identity is cells occupying discrete um, types, but it looks increasingly like, in many cases, um, cell identity is more of a continuous phenomenon where cells can um, kind of transition between uh, stable minima um, continuously. We also want to be able to di distinguish technical confounders for biological signals because one of the main challenges with single cell data is the large amount of technical noise due to uncontrolled variation across experiments as well as just the inherent challenges of measuring quantities from an individual cell. Um, and additionally, we want to be able to incorporate these multiple kinds of data, which is very challenging because the data each have their own intrinsic technical biases, which are completely different, and they often measure completely different features. For example, gene expression is a completely different type of measurement than chromatin accessibility. Um, 
we expect them to be correlated in some way, but they're different modalities, and so um, integrating them is challenging. So that's kind of the, uh, the space in which I'm working here. Uh, and so last year, during my postdoc with Evan, and also into this year, I'm still working on this, we developed an approach called LIGER, Linked Inference of Genomic Experimental Relationships. And uh, the name came from a LIGER, which is what you get if you read a lion and a tiger. And uh, th this is kind of a metaphor for what we're doing with the approach, which is blending different kinds of data together. Um, and we released a preprint on the bioarchive last fall. And just within the last couple of weeks, the paper was accepted by Cell. And uh, so this is our graphical abstract from the Cell paper. So basically what we did is we um, developed this approach, LIGER, which uses integrative non-negative matrix factorization. Um, and we investigated several different ways of performing data integration. We did it uh, across individuals to identify human subject variation, across species to integrate mouse and human cells. And then we also integrated different modalities, including gene expression, spatial trans transcriptomic data, and single cell genomic data. And um, LIGER outputs a set of um, metagene factors, which allow us to identify both the similarities and differences in cells across data sets, and also perform multi-omic integration. So um, this is kind of the summary of the paper. And now I'm going to walk you through sort of how I developed this approach and some of the decisions that I made and alternative approaches considered, um, and also give you an overview of the um, what I learned about non-negative matrix factorization in the process. So um, a necessary first step for a lot of single cell data processing is performing dimensionality reduction. And uh, this is helpful for two reasons. First, uh, as a simply uh, computational and practical reason, um, the reducing the number of dimensions in the data um, allows you to operate more efficiently on it. So rather than working with, say, a 10,000 by 20,000 dimensional matrix, um, we can now work with a 10,000 by 20 dimensional matrix. And there are a number of techniques that are used to perform dimensionality reduction, including PCA and ICA and NMF. And all of these approaches can also be thought of as denoising the data or extracting the most dominant signals that you can use to summarize the structure of the data. So in addition to just computational efficiency, dimensionality reduction allows us to denoise the data and account for some of these um, biases and noise in data. And so a first step for a lot of single cell approaches is to do dimensionality reduction. And uh, a common choice for dimensionality reduction is PCA, principal component analysis. And uh, PCA um, is uh, an optimal approach under certain assumptions, and it produces a low dimensional representation that has certain properties, including um, that it is, uh, each of the components are mutually orthogonal. NMF is an alternative approach um, which makes different assumptions about the data <coughs> and produces a representation that has some different uh, properties. In particular, the factors that you get after performing NMF are not necessarily orthogonal. <coughs> um, and PCA is globally optimal, um, a globally optimal solution to the optimization problem uh, by which it's formulated, whereas NMF, the objective function, is a non-convex problem. And so you can't hope to obtain a globally optimal solution. All you can hope for is a locally optimal solution. And so um, traditionally, when people do NMF, they have to perform multiple restarts and take the best objective. Um, however, there are some cases in which the orthogonality restriction of PCA is actually a limitation. And uh, NMF, is, since it doesn't have this limitation, sometimes it can better capture distinct factors, whereas PCA might sort of mash them together. And here's a geometric example of how this could be the case. So if you have this point cloud, um, two principal components would be these green arrows. Note that they're orthogonal, but neither of them really captures the actual directions of variation of the data. So both of them kind of capture a combination of these two axes of variation, which uh, a different approach that doesn't have the orthogonality restriction like ICA or NMF could actually better uh, capture. And this turns out to be an important property, which I'll come back to in a bit. Um, Another advantage of NMF is that it yields yeah. interpretable factors. Yeah. Yeah. So just the way it 
clots, or is there some biology? Um, so orthogonality is just a simple mathematical definition that is essentially um, means that the axes are perpendicular in multiple dimensions. Um, so the uh, axes are themselves. Correct. Or is it, or is it, that's correct. Well, um, yeah, the, the axes are the principal components that you infer from the data. That's correct. Um, so the question is, how do those axes relate to the actual underlying biological signals, which I'll, I'll come back to in a second. Um, so another um, benefit of NMF is that it, it yields interpretable factors. So this is a figure from the original NMF paper in Nature um, showing the difference between the way NMF and PCA um, represent faces when you do dimensionality reduction on face images. So you can see that um, this is an example reconstructed image using the PCA and the NMF um, low dimensional representations. You can see the reconstructions are essentially identical. But what's different is that if you look at the um, dimensions themselves, the pixels here are colored by the intensity of their loading on each dimension. You can see that with the NMF uh, factors, the factor, each factor kind of represents um, a part of the face. So you can see mouth, here and here, um, and you can see some, some eyelashes or eyelids here. Whereas if you look at the principal components, it's really not easy to understand what each individual principal component represents. It's some kind of holistic property of the faces. Um, and the other thing that makes it hard to understand the NMF um, or the uh, principal components is that individual components can contribute either positively or negatively to the reconstruction, and that's why some of them are colored black and some of them are colored red. And so um, it makes it really hard to understand how you're actually reconstructing this face in terms of the individual principal components. Whereas with NMF, you can clearly see, for example, um, this factor right here uh, corresponds to uh, chin. And so the mouth is way up at the top. Uh, here, here's a, uh, a mouth factor. And that one's actually activated strongly as well. Uh, so the idea is that an advantage of NMF is that you can actually point to how a particular factor contributes to the reconstruction of high-dimensional data. So now, if we imagine um, doing NMF on uh, gene expression data, we have a matrix that has N cells and G genes, and we want to decompose it in such a way that we have K factors, um, which we use to reconstruct the data, and we're going to identify the gene loading values, so we can think of each of these rows of the W matrix as being a metagene, and each of the columns in this matrix as being <coughs> the expression of that metagene in a particular cell. Question, Josh. Yeah. So here, H and W are both uh, non-negative. There are different flavor of only one of them is non-negative, the other one can be free. Yes, that would be called, I think it's called semi-NMF. Yes, that's possible. Um, so, D1 is is metric H and W will be then by transport. Um, that's a good question. I don't think that there's anything in the optimization that would require that to be the case. So my guess would be no. Um, one thing I should mention mathematically about this is that. Um, the solution is not unique. So for any H and W, if you multiply H by a matrix and then multiply W by the inverse of that matrix, um, you get a, another solution that has the same objective function value. So that probably means that in your in your case, the matrices will not be. So. Um, okay, so here I'm showing one example um, of the advantage of this interpretability property. Um, I'll show some others later in the talk. This is one of the things that um, got Evan and myself excited about these factorization approaches. So uh, here I'm showing factor 11 from, um, this is a zebrafish heart regeneration data set. Um, and you can see that this, uh, so this is a, a two-dimensional representation of the data, and I'm coloring each cell by the uh, 
loading value on this factor. And you can see that this factor loads on um, all of the cell clusters. And within each cluster, it has kind of different values for some cells than others. And um, if we look at the, the top loading genes on this factor, they're all mitochondrial genes. And uh, we know that the difference in uh, the amount of mitochondrial genes per cell is a common source of technical variation. Uh, this tends to vary between batches, and it's an uncontrolled variable even within batches. And so the fact that we have a factor um, that indicates the amount of sort of mitochondrial gene expression here allows us to either use or not use that source of variation when we're clustering the cells. And we've observed in a lot of cases that if we identify a technical factor like this and then remove it before clustering, we get clusters that more accurately represent biological differences among cells. Because for example, this, this group of cells right here, um, if we just naively perform clustering using all the factors, this might show up as a separate cluster. Whereas if we remove this factor, then it turns out that these cells are really not very different from these cells biologically, and they get merged into a single, more correct cluster. So this is one advantage of having interpretable factors. Yeah, go ahead. So if you say the solution of the lineup is not unique, then the top genes here will always be the same or not? Not necessarily always, um, but it's, it's pretty stable nice. empirically, yeah. I would be surprised biologically the mitochondrial content of cells be variable. It is it is variable for sure. Might be loses. It's true, you might be. Yeah. So in some cases, um, the mitochondrial content of the cell could actually be an important variable. But in this case, we actually, we, we found that uh, removing this gave us that for a number of other independent reasons look much more. <clears throat> okay, so that's NMF in general. And in order to integrate data from multiple data sets, um, we use a modified version of NMF called integrative NMF. And the uh, main difference between iNMF and regular NMF is that we now um, have multiple data sets which share a set of genes uh, but have different, potentially different numbers of cells. And we're going to force the metagene matrix to be a sum of two different matrices, one which is shared across data sets and one which is data set specific. And um, this has several advantages. So um, by having this uh, shared matrix across data sets, this causes each factor to essentially have the same biological interpretation across data sets because um, there's a common set of genes that define this factor across the data sets. But at the same time, we can also identify the data set specific ways in which these factors of variation change. And this has two advantages. One is that it allows us to account for sort of nuisance variation. Um, for example, if we have two different batches where we expect identical cell composition um, and we do PCA and we find that the cells separate by batches, um, these data set specific terms can allow us to identify for each factor what is the nuisance variable uh, that makes this factor different. At the same time, um, it also allows us to um, actually identify these data set specific signals themselves, which in a lot of cases um, if there are biological differences among your data sets, um, these factor differences can give you insights into the biological differences. And I'll show you some examples. Um, and before we tried this, we tried something simpler, which was to just simply stack our data sets. So stack these E matrices and perform regular NMF on them. And we found that if we did this, uh, we didn't get the effect we wanted because the resulting factors contain some factors where the, um, the signal was essentially, is it from data set A or from data set B? And the rest of the factors had some mingling of shared and distinct sources of variation. So um, explicitly separating out these data set specific effects allows us to much more accurately identify corresponding factors of variation across these. And uh, so we use this um, 
integrative non-negative matrix factorization in Liger, and we developed an additional approach that uh, performs robust joint clustering uh, using a shared factor neighborhood graph across data sets. And this allows us to be able to um, robustly identify shared and data set specific populations. So now I'm gonna tell you some about um, NMF and how we actually implemented this INMF algorithm. So the objective function for regular NMF is the following. Um, we want to minimize um, the squared Frobenius norm between the matrix and its reconstruction, HW, subject to the constraint that H and W are both positive. Here's the objective for integrative NMF. It's essentially the same, except we have the addition of a data set specific term, and we have a shared metagene matrix uh, that's shared across all the data sets. And we also introduced a regularization term. Uh, which minimizes the data set specific effects. And I can talk about that a little bit later. Still non negative. That's correct. Subject to the constraints that H, V, and W are all non negative. And so um, this optimization problem is non convex. Uh, and there have been several different approaches developed to solving it. So the first approach that was developed by Lee and Sung in the Nature paper is called multiplicative update algorithm. And uh, this algorithm is easy to derive and easy to implement. The way you derive it is you essentially um, write out the first order optimality conditions for this optimization problem, which are defined by the KKT conditions if you've taken um, uh, optimization. Um, and then once you do that, you can actually um, solve for H, the individual elements of H and W um, in closed form. But the problem is that H and W occur on both sides of the equation. So you have to iterate these updates. So the way that you do it, uh, this algorithm, is you initialize H and W with random values, and then you iterate until convergence, update each element of H the following way, update each element of W using this equation, and iterate until convergence. And uh, you can show, uh, based on the KK, KKT conditions, that um, these updates uh, do, do not increase the objective function value. So this approach works, um, but there's two main drawbacks. One is the speed of convergence, and two is that there's no theoretical convergence guarantee. So the only uh, thing, thing we know about this solution is that the updates do not increase the objective function on each, <coughs> update, on each iteration. So we don't actually have a guarantee that the, um, that the optimization strategy converges to a local minimum. Uh, so people, uh, after the multiplicative updates, develop new approaches based on block coordinate descent. So um, gradient descent is a very commonly used way of optimizing these sorts of objective functions. And the idea is essentially that you start at a random point, and at each step in the optimization, you um, compute the gradient, and then take a step in the direction that the gradient is pointing, and you repeat that. Coordinate descent is different in that you only move along one coordinate at a time during the optimization. And um, the gradient descent is often more well-behaved, but for certain types of objective functions, including the one that we're working on, coordinate descent um, can work just as well. And it has the additional advantage that it's often easier to solve the optimization problem along one coordinate at a time, holding the others fixed, as opposed to trying to um, solve it um, for all coordinates at once. And uh, in our case, um, we can actually um, break the optimization problem into blocks and optimize blocks of coordinates at a time holding the others fixed. So this is a, a diagram from a paper, a very helpful review paper by Kim and Park, where they review block coordinate descent algorithms for NMF and non-negative tensor factorization. And um, so you can think of um, blocks of variables here as being either the entire matrix W and the entire matrix H, or individual factors, which are columns of W and rows of H, or individual elements of each of these matrices. Um, and, and then you can perform block coordinate descent by taking steps along one block, holding the other space. And there's a, a really helpful uh, classic theorem in uh, nonlinear optimization, or sorry, non-convex optimization from Bertsekis, which is that a block coordinate descent algorithm is guaranteed to converge if the parameters lie in a closed convex set, which ours do, um, 
and if the block coordinate descent subproblems are convex. So because we have this um, Frobenius norm loss, if we hold W or H fixed, the problem is convex in the other. Uh, and the block coordinate descent algorithm empirically converges very fast for the uh, NMF problem. Um, so now I'm going to walk you through some of the different strategies we tried. So the first one uh, that we tried, the first block coordinate descent, is an alternating least squares algorithm. Um, and essentially what you do here is you fix W, and then you use um, non-negative least squares regression to um, identify the optimal H given that W, and then you repeat. Um, and this is quite easy to implement if you have a, a non-negative least square solver. Um, and it has the advantage that you solve each subproblem exactly. Uh, and it's fairly straightforward to do this because it's just a least squares problem. The, uh, the thing that makes it a little difficult is the non-negativity constraint. Um, and so here are the updates um, that you would have to iterate for integrative non-negative matrix factorization. You can see that it's, um, it's not too difficult uh, to write out the objective, and it's actually um, quite similar to what you would do for regular NMF. It just involves stacking. So, uh, so the challenge and the, the limitation of this approach is that the non-negative least squares subproblems, um, it's difficult to solve them all efficiently because you essentially have to solve a different subproblem for each of the elements of uh, W. But it turns out that there's sufficient overlap among the subproblems that you can actually leverage the overlap in a smart way um, using a strategy called block principle pivoting, which was developed by Professor Park at Georgia Tech. And with block principle pivoting, you can leverage the commonalities among the regression subproblems to solve them quickly. Um, and um, you still have the property that you're, you're solving the uh, optimization exactly uh, for this uh, for the block that you are um, updating at that point. Uh, another popular strategy for optimizing the NMF objective is called hierarchical alternating least squares. And it's called hierarchical because, um, again, you hold W fixed and solve for H, but you do it hierarchically where you solve for each of the factors um, iteratively. Um, and so essentially you're dividing the variables into, uh, for INMF, we're dividing the variables into 2D plus 1 times K subproblems, vector blocks instead of matrix blocks. <clears throat> and um, for, this, for the case of vector blocks, you can actually um, calculate just using the derivatives in closed form uh, what the optimal update is for each of the factors. And uh, if you do this for INMF, you get these updates here. And uh, the, the bracket plus means um, we're going to uh, take the max between x and epsilon, where epsilon is a small positive value. And uh, this um, both enforces the non-negativity constraints and uh, avoids numerical problems uh, with uh, factors that are all zero. And uh, so if you look at the form of these updates, you can see that uh, they will be fairly straightforward to code. And most of the work actually goes into computing uh, these matrix products here. So um, if you're using a language like MATLAB or R or Python that has highly optimized matrix routines, it's usually pretty efficient. So you can actually go a step further and accelerate the house algorithm even more um, by uh, using a, a clever trick, which is that we update each block up to A times in a row, which allows reuse of the matrix products here, which are actually fixed for the entire block. Um, and the uh, theorem of Bert Sekis still holds in the case where you update um, a fixed number of times uh, each coordinate before updating next. As long as each coordinate gets updated within a fixed number of iterations, um, the uh, block coordinate descent algorithm will still converge. And so um, it's actually possible to calculate um, this optimal value of A uh, empirically based on the sparsity pattern of your matrix and um, the uh, relative sizes of the matrices. 
Um, <clears throat> and I, I also uh, tried out this approach, but um, the matrices that, that we're using are sufficiently sparse that it really didn't um, help very much. So this was not, not worth money. Uh, so the, the algorithm we ended up going with was the ALS algorithm. Um, and actually, this is the algorithm that's preferred by uh, PARC as well in their implementation of NMF. And it's, it's hard to beat just because since you're solving the, um, the coordinate updates exactly on each iteration, it really decreases the objective function quickly. So here's a, a benchmark showing um, how the multiplicative updates approach compares with the ALS approach um, for different values of K on two different single cell data sets. And uh, the, this PBMC data set has about 12,000 cells, and the pancreas data set has uh, about 10,000. And so you can see that we're, we're converging um, much more rapidly. And in a lot of cases, the objective value that we're achieving is lower than what the multiplicative updates converges to. And it also converges um, in what I would consider to be reasonable amount of time for the uh, data sets that we're analyzing, which is around two to three to four minutes. Okay, um, so another um, type of NMF algorithm, which I didn't know about, but discovered in the course of this project is online NMF algorithms. This is a really interesting area. Um, online approaches essentially um, address the problem where you have data that's continually coming in and you can't store it all but you want to compute some result, essentially using the whole data set. Uh, and it's, they're called online algorithms because this is a common problem with um, online web applications where you have data constantly coming in and you have to update uh, your analysis of the data. So there's a, a really interesting field um, that tries to develop online algorithms, and there's actually a number of online algorithms for performing NMF. Um, so, Two key advantages of these approaches, one is that you can avoid storing the entire data set in memory, um, and the other is that you can refine the results as data continues to arrive. So um, I thought this would be a nice feature to have in Liger because um, we can continually update our definition of cell identity as new data sets arrive, and also we're getting to the point now where we're analyzing data sets that have hundreds of thousands or millions of cells, and storing them all in memory is, is um, annoying. Uh, so, rather than implementing something that's a true online algorithm, I first tried um, sort of a smart initialization strategy just to see how this would work, and it, it actually turned out to work quite well. So the idea was that um, <clears throat> since we know the metagene, uh, the identity of the metagenes from an initial run through the data, um, we can use those metagenes to come up with a smart initialization um, for new data points um, by simply solving um, this non-negative least squares problem. Um, and then we can um, use this initial value for our H on the new cells and just restart the optimization at that point using the um, initialization from the previous version of the data set. And then we can just iterate those updates until convergence. Uh, we can also use a similar strategy uh, to update the number of factors on the fly. And so there's two different cases you have to consider depending on whether you're increasing or uh, decreasing the number of factors. <clears throat> and so um, if we're increasing the number of factors, uh, we can um, we can initialize the new factors using these um, updates based on the um, existing factors. And then um, we just restart the optimization using these initializations. Uh, for if we want to decrease K, um, then we first compute this sigma value that essentially tells how much each factor contributes to the reconstruction. And we pick the K2 factors with the largest sigma value and then um, simply restart the optimization. And when we benchmark these approaches, they actually work quite well. And you can see that, um, especially in the case of adding new data, the approach converges extremely uh, fast in uh, 
less than a fourth of the time that's required to, to recompute from scratch using all of the data. Um, we also, I, I didn't mention this, but it, it's also straightforward to show that you can change the value of the regularization parameter, lambda, um, uh, to, uh, to try a different um, uh, constraint on the similarity of the data sets uh, much more efficiently than you could from restarting the factorization from scratch. Okay, so the this was a, an initial online approach, um, but not a true online approach because um, it's mostly just an initialization strategy, even though in, in practice it gives you a, a similar um, effect. So the way that you can perform NMF online is to uh, identify a surrogate function and, um, and then optimize it using stochastic gradient descent. And someone showed in 2010 that if you use this surrogate function um, for the NMF objective, it converges almost surely to the optimal value of NMF as T approaches infinity. Um, so the nice thing about this approach, and it's, it's kind of a neat trick, uh, the updates for the metagene matrix depend only on the cell factors and data. Uh, they depend only through two matrix products, A and B. And you can compute these matrix products incrementally as new data arrives. So essentially, when you get new data, um, you just uh, form this matrix product on the new data and then add it to the, uh, the accumulated matrix product from the previous data. Uh, and I, I tried out um, the implementation of this online learning algorithm from the 2010 paper. And I tried it out on some single cell data and it, it performs quite well. Um, so this is a uh, batch NMF using the HALS um, optimization strategy. And the red line is the online NMF. And you can see that it converges in um, less than a sixth of the time that's required for the, uh, the batch algorithm. And in addition, it has the, uh, the online version has the advantage that um, you don't have to store the data in memory. So another, uh, another trick you can do with NMF is um, missing data imputation. And NMF is actually really good at this uh, because of its parts-based representation. So a simple extension that allows imp imp imputation in NMF is um, to define a weight matrix where um, AIJ is one if the data is observed and zero otherwise. And then just perform, uh, optimize this objective where we take the um, element-wise matrix product between A and the loss. Um, and you can optimize this objective using any of the strategies that I presented. Um, and then uh, at the end, <clears throat> you have a matrix um, where you can impute, uh, you can impute the missing elements of the matrix um, using an objective uh, that was trained only on the observed elements of the data. So I haven't implemented this yet for INMF, but um, it's something that I'm planning to do. Um, a couple other uh, moves you can make with NMF is to use a different loss. So instead of taking the simple Euclidean distance between your reconstruction and the data, you can uh, use a different divergence like the KL divergence or the Itakura Saito divergence. Um, and people have found this to be better for count data in some cases and this to be better for um, audio spectrum. Um, another trick is um, you can actually uh, write the NMF objective uh, probabilistically. Um, and this is what David Bly and his graduate students did in 2015 when they developed an approach called hierarchical Poisson factorization. The idea of HPF is um, your uh, observed counts are produced by a Poisson distribution where the rate parameter is determined by the vector product of a row vector and a column vector. And then um, you can further put uh, distributional assumptions on uh, these row and column vectors um, using a, a gamma distribution. And this gamma Poisson model actually gives you something where the, um, the count for an individual gene across cells is negative binomial distributed, which um, matches well with how people think about the distributional properties of single cell RNA-seq, for example. Uh, and somebody recently uh, implemented um, HPF for single cell RNA-seq data in uh, MSB molecular systems biology. Um, we've tried this out and it, it works pretty well, but it's extremely slow because um, I, 
estimating the posterior distribution under these assumptions for a large matrix is uh, quite challenging and very slow. Uh, and it, in practice, we also notice that it tends to oversmooth data, possibly because of the, uh, the Bayesian nature of the optimization. Um, so now I'm, I'm just going to go through quickly some of the things that we've used this for um, and give you a sense for what the uh, Liger algorithm can do. So we, uh, we generated a data set from the mouse bed nucleus, which is this tiny little region inside the brain. Um, and this had never been uh, sequenced using single cell RNA-seq. And we found a crazy number of cell types. We have actually never seen a region in the brain that has this many distinct cell types. And it, it may be partly because this region has kind of a, an integrative role in integrating signals from all throughout the brain. Um, and the thing that's really interesting about the bed nucleus is that it's the most sexually dimorphic region in the brain. So we, did, we sequenced male and female mice and uh, compared the gene expression from the male and female mice. And the, uh, the, the, a lot of the cell types come from the principal nucleus of the bed nucleus, which is also the most dimorphic region within the bed nucleus. And if we look at um, the me uh, metagene factor that uh, loads most strongly on this region, we can identify um, the male and female specific genes that are specific, that are dimorphic specifically within this population by looking at the data set specific factors. Um, and uh, so the genes that we found here, um, there were some known hits. There's, I think, 12 genes that somebody painstakingly validated as dimorphic in this region. But we also found a bunch of new ones, including some very clear uh, dimorphic genes like ETL4, ACBR1C. Um, so again, the interpretability of the factors is key here because it allows us to identify not only that cell types are shared between male and female, but specifically how each of those cell types differs. Uh, we also did uh, a related analysis in the substantia nigra, which is the part of the brain that produces dopamine and goes wrong in Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, we were able to identify um, corresponding cells across human donors. We had seven human donors. And putting the data from these um, different samples together was actually quite challenging because um, there are so many uncontrolled factors of variation. So this was frozen brain bank tissue. And um, we had like three males and four females, uh, ages between 20 and 70, and cause of death, everything from heart attack to um, brain trauma. Uh, and so um, we were able to put these together using um, the shared factors that Liger infers and we were also able to identify some human subject differences among these patients um, using the data set specific factors in Liger. And we found a couple of interesting things. Uh, one was that um, there was uh, the patient uh, 5828 um, had a lot of uh, uh, genes related to uh, cell activation upregulated. And it turned out that this was the patient who had died uh, from head trauma. And this is a uh, the genes that we found as being data set specific um, are known genes that are related to uh, response to traumatic brain injury. Um, we also uh, noticed some genes um, upregulated uh, related to unfolded protein response um, and also APOE, which is a, a gene that's commonly seen in a number of neurodegenerative diseases. And it turned out that 5840 um, had a post-mortem diagnosis of cerebral amyloid angiopathy which is um, a neurodegenerative disease related to uh, 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 amyloid accumulation. Um, so it, it was interesting that we were able to identify these um, data set specific differences from the um, data set specific factors. We were also able to take the uh, substantia nigra cells from human and map them to mouse substantia nigra cells to identify corresponding cell types. And we were hoping that we would find some cell types that were human specific, but we didn't really. Um, we actually found some cell types that were mouse specific, but it turned out that they were related to um, anatomical and dissection differences. So for example, we found uh, this population of astrocytes um, was mouse specific. And it turns out that this particular subtype of astrocytes is only located in a certain part of the brain that's very much closer to the substantia nigra in mouse than in human. Um, so the, the cross-species analysis essentially showed that 
the cell types are quite similar between mouse and human. Uh, we were also able to integrate single cell RNA seq with spatial transcriptomic data. Um, and we use data from a protocol called StarMap, which can measure up to 1,000 cells, uh, 1,000 genes per cell um, with spatial resolution. And uh, so we, we were able to, um, using the shared factors that Liger produces, we were able to um, identify which um, uh, clusters from Dropsy corresponded to which clusters from StarMap, and we're actually able to plot the spatial distributions of the cell types um, using the coordinates of the star map data. And when, when we did this, uh, one thing that we found which was unexpected and interesting is that there's a subtype of astrocytes um, which has this spatial distribution according to the star map data, which we confirmed with um, in situ staining from the Allen Brain Atlas. Um, and it turns out that this is the same subtype of astrocytes that we saw was mouse specific. Uh, and this helped us to understand why, because uh, this part of the brain here is, is very much closer to the substantia nigra in mouse than in human. Uh, so once we had um, this mapping from DropSeq to StarMap, we were able to impute the spatial uh, gene expression patterns of genes not measured by StarMap, because StarMap can only measure about 1,000 genes per cell. Um, and we... Uh, we were able to confirm using, uh, by holding out some genes and then imputing them, that we could correctly impute the spatial patterns of these genes. Um, and uh, we were also able to do this for, um, for complex um, spatial patterns like this BSG, which is a marker of endothelial cells. And this is a strip of uh, vasculature that apparently was left in the place. Uh, we were also able to do multimodal integration with RNA and uh, methylation data. And this was the most challenging type of integration that we did because um, it's not clear exactly what the relationship between methylation and expression is, but we were able to identify corresponding cell types by assuming that uh, the gene body methylation for a gene is negatively correlated with its expression. Uh, and doing this, um, we identified a set of um, joint clusters that matched very closely with the um, annotations of the RNA and methylation that had already been published. And they also um, helped us to clarify a couple of the um, methylation populations, which are hard to identify, because um, most of the previous studies that identify cell types have looked at either protein or RNA expression. So if you just have methylation for a cell, it's sometimes hard to figure out what cell type it is. But by mapping the RNA data onto the methylation data, or, or vice versa, um, we were able to identify, for example, MDL3, mouse deep layer 3, is actually a uh, clostrum. Um, and also, um, there is a discrepancy between um, clusters, layer 5B, which the methylation um, uh, analysis thought that it was actually from layer 6. And it turns out the reason for this misannotation was that um, these cells have very low overall levels of methylation, and none of the common layer five markers um, from expression actually were very clearly visible. Um, another thing that uh, we were able to do with the methylation data was to actually identify cell types with better resolution than was possible with the methylation alone. So we zoomed in um, on this plot. We pulled out just these uh, MGE cells uh, and did a second level of clustering and we're able to identify a total of 12 clusters, whereas before I think they had identified two in the methylation analysis alone. And when we look at these clusters, we can confirm that they're not just um, sort of spurious uh, imputed structure by comparing the methylation and expression for these genes, um, some of the marker genes of these clusters, and noting that they have um, extremely anti-correlated um, expression and methylation. And we were able even able to identify this type uh, of cells here, MGE12, which are called um, total cells, and they represent 0.1% of all the cells in the data set. Um, so the fact that we were able to identify these in the methylation data was, was pretty surprising. And, uh, exciting. Uh, and uh, we also, <clears throat> we didn't include this in the paper, but we're now working on integrating RNA and single cell attack-seq data, which is 
even more challenging because the attack seek data is extremely sparse. You usually only get about 10,000 reads per cell. Um, and so, uh, and in addition, the relationship between accessibility and expression is a uh, fairly weak correlation. So it's challenging, but um, we have some initial results that it's possible. This is a, a, a mouse cortex, RNA, and attack seek integration. Uh, another application that I'm actively working on is using Liger to um, uh, integrate data across different time points in development and using this to study cardiac regeneration in zebrafish and human cortical development. Um, and we can also um, use Liger to integrate DropSeq data and SlideSeq. SlideSeq is a new experimental technique that my postdoc mentor Evan recently published um, that gives you unbiased transcriptome-wide spatial measurements. Um, and using Liger, we can identify the spatial locations of these port, uh, clusters in the drop seat data. So with that, I will end and acknowledge um, the folks in the McCosco lab who did the actual experiments. Belina helped some with uh, coding the Liger R package, and uh, Marta and Arpi from uh, Steve McCarroll's lab. Thank you. So I have a question. Uh, uh, does Liger require uh, to have the same set of genes in order to unlock them? Yes, it requires that you have corresponding features across the sets. So following, following up on that, uh, for the kind of attack and RNA integration, right. kind of which way have you found is best to unify the feature set? Is it like just taking promoter accessibility, or is it taking accessibility over the whole gene body? Or, or? Yeah, um, I'm actually working on testing that out right now. Um, I have two data sets, and in one data set, the gene plus promoter is the best, and the other promoter only seems the best. That's not, it's not entirely clear why that's the case. Go ahead. So did you do any studies on what's the of data on this thing versus how well the imputation works? I haven't actually tried it for, oh, um, so the only imputation we did was this um, spatial. Um, and uh, so we investigated uh, several ways. Is this what you were asking about? The yeah, spatial the imputation. imputation. Yeah. So just to be clear, I haven't actually implemented the weighted NMF that um, performs imputation on missing data. Um, here we did the imputation by um, identifying for each spatial cell its 10 nearest um, drop seek cells, and then just simply taking the average. And that was good enough to get this, this level of performance. Um, but we assessed this in a couple ways. So we tried um, leaving out one gene at a time and recomputing the factorization uh, and then imputing that missing gene. And we compared that to um, using all of the data and imputing genes that were used in the alignment. And we found that it, the results were essentially identical. So, we, uh, so leaving out genes didn't really change the results at all. Um, but comparing uh, the, the measured genes with their imputed versions um, showed that we were able to do pretty well. Uh, another thing we tried was we um, used a, sort of a dumb imputation strategy, which was to take the joint clusters and then just simply set the imputed value to being the expression average across the cluster. And we found that the uh, mean squared error was actually significantly higher when we did that compared to when we looked at the 20 nearest neighbors um, across data sets. Any other questions? Another point. For the young kids, oh, I think a taxi, when the problem is open, there's a, a few hour delay of the dream. Yeah. So how to handle that a few hours delay? Right. Um, <clears throat> so I've looked at, I guess, three data sets now. Two of the data sets are mature, fully differentiated cells where there's essentially steady state, no differentiation expected. For those cases, I haven't seen um, any examples where the tag is decoupled from the RNA. But I also have this set, um, 
And I observed that in this data set, there's an intermediate population, which is kind of between two sulfates. And that was significantly less correlated with expression than any of the other populations. So for that, for that case, um, essentially Liger just says these populations are different. But yeah, that's, that's definitely something interesting to look at more. Any other questions? All right.